The year is 2020. Orbiting high above the Earth is a telescope far more powerful than any before. It has just made a discovery that will change our lives forever. It has found an inhabited planet outside our solar system. More than 50 light years from Earth, the telescope has located a world that glows like an oasis in the vast emptiness of space. It's cloaked in oceans and continents. This is a truly alien world. The air is so thick, humans could not survive here. And it's home to giants. Terrifying predators dominate the skies. Fantasy? Think again. Scientists believe we could find a world like this within 10 years. And they're preparing now for what we may find. Some of the world's leading scientists have come to this specially designed lab to continue their investigation into what extraterrestrial life might be like and where in the universe we are most likely to find it. All are world's leaders in the fields of astronomy, astrophysics, biology and biomechanics. And all share one vision, that we are not alone. Many things about this environment are going to be strange by our standards. This is the century for the discovery of extraterrestrial life. We have new programs looking for remote planets. We have new search strategies. We have new experiments being carried out on Earth. It's an incredibly exciting time to be here. In preparation for what we might find, the scientists gathered here have begun to investigate which worlds are most likely to sustain life. They've designed life forms that could survive on an alien planet. But where are we most likely to find life? This is our galaxy, the Milky Way. Home to a hundred billion stars and at least as many planets. Earth is in this cluster of stars over here, and it's in a nearby region of the galaxy called Cygnus that our experts believe we're most likely to find life first. The idea that there might be life out there has been around for a long time. And what has changed is the realization that we have the technology now to answer the question. Over the next 10 years, a new generation of telescopes will be launched into space. More powerful than any before, they'll peer into the Cygnus constellation. It's one of the densest areas of stars in our galaxy. If life is out there, our greatest chance of finding it will be here, simply because the number of stars is so great. To narrow down the search, the scientists have decided to investigate a very common configuration in our galaxy. Twin stars. More than half of all stars are in fact twins. Previously, astronomers thought twins were too unstable to let planets orbit around them. 
But it turns out that if the planet is far enough away from those two stars, or if it's orbiting one or the other of them, then indeed the, the orbits can be stable, and you can have worlds that stay in their orbits for billions of years, and that could very well have life. This recent discovery has opened up a vast opportunity for life in the universe. And the scientists will be looking for twin star solar systems like this. More than 50 light years from Earth, a star orbits with its twin. And orbiting around the two suns is a gas giant. A thousand times bigger than Earth, it's a violent, lifeless planet. But there's another world here. Orbiting around the gas giant is a moon. It's exactly the kind of world the astronomers hope to find. You could have a moon the size of Earth, uh, big enough that it could have an atmosphere, that it could have an ocean, and one that, that could be supportive of life of all sorts, including very sophisticated life. Could this be a place where life might exist? And if so, what would it look like? <laughs> the astronomers and astrophysicists gathered here have begun a groundbreaking project. They're investigating every detail of what a habitable moon could be like. is coming to life. For life to survive, the moon will need a viable atmosphere and most critically, water, the essential medium for all life. If the moon is large enough, if it's geologically active, so it can recycle gases like carbon dioxide into its atmosphere through volcanoes, for instance, then it's quite possible that a moon like this could have a viable atmosphere. All the parameters the scientists explored show the moon could sustain life. Potential of saying, well, this variation might tell us that there's a blue moon there, and in fact, we might be dealing with the potentially habitable planet. The scientists named it the Blue Moon. They decided to model it with a dense atmosphere. A scenario they believe could be very common in the universe. As far as the uh, blue moon goes, it has three times the atmospheric density as the Earth has. This pressurized air will make levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide much higher. The oxygen level is about 30%. Oxygen feeds fires like nothing else. At these levels, it will push Blue Moon's atmosphere to the brink of spontaneous combustion. Fires here will be frequent. The Blue Moon will be a world on the edge. One person goes out without a spacesuit. They're back within a minute. Their description is terrifying. It's an immense pressure. They can hardly breathe. It's hot, it's clammy, and they feel as if they're being pushed down by the most extraordinary weight. It's nothing like the Earth at all. You're about to visit a world scientists believe could exist in our galaxy, the Blue Moon. It's got blue seas, it's got clouds in the atmosphere. And the continents are cloaked with something, maybe some strangely colored vegetation. I'd love to see a world like that. Sunrise on the blue moon.
Giant forests more than a kilometer high dominate the landscape. But this is a volatile world. Fires ignited by lightning and fueled by the high oxygen levels will be an extreme risk. Its dense atmosphere is like a gas ocean, and it will support some of the strangest aliens. Aliens that float, glide, and fly. The sorts of life forms on Blue Moon I think would be totally fascinating. When we look in the atmosphere, there's a sort of almost greenish haze. It's almost like a plankton. But beyond that, there are these immense shapes. Are they gliding? Are they flying? All we can tell is they must be very large animals indeed. It's far, far beyond anything we're familiar with. This is a genuinely alien world. The Pagoda Forest is the setting for an extraordinary story of how extraterrestrial life could survive in an extreme world. Fields of strange floating plants fill breaks in the Pagoda's dense canopy. It's the territory of deadly predators the size of eagles, the stalkers. And they hunt giants. life forms have been created by some of the world's leading biologists and biomechanists. There's a sort of predictability to life on Earth, which surely we can extrapolate across the galaxy. And even at this stage, we can predict the sorts of organisms will be adapted for living in this thick, viscous atmosphere. Everything about these aliens has been scientifically calculated. From the dimension of their wings, how they might see, to how they could interact with each other on this strange world. Because if you find those, at least you know there's life there. There are wonderful opportunities for flight here. If you've got denser air, heavier air, it's going to be easier for big things to fly on the blue moon. Amazingly big things. Soaring high above the pagoda forest are sky whales. With a wingspan of more than 10 meters, they're the blue moon's largest flying creatures. They're feeding on clouds of floating plants buoyed up by the dense atmosphere. The likelihood of sky whales seems very high. They ought to exist. So on the blue moon, we have animals which originally were swimming in the oceans. But because the atmosphere in blue moon is so thick, one can imagine something swimming in the ocean to flying in the atmosphere, effectively as a single transition. It's opening new eyes to the way in which evolution can happen on alien planets. Guided by their sonar, these gentle giants glide on the thermal updrafts. What a magnificent beast this is. A sky whale weighs as much as a rhinoceros. That's 10 times larger than the largest thing that has ever flown on Earth, a pterosaur. At the time of the dinosaurs, we had in the sky gigantic flying reptiles. Why was that? Well, one of the best explanations is that the levels of atmospheric oxygen were substantially higher than they are today. There was basically more energy available. These things could get to gigantic size. And so when we go to other planets with similarly high levels of oxygen and also a much thicker atmosphere, not only will those animals be bigger than we're familiar with, but much bigger. Oxygen levels are so high that creatures here will have 50% more muscle power than on Earth. 
This enables giants like the sky whales to spend their entire lives on the wing. It will also supercharge their main predator, the stalkers, giving them phenomenal flying power as they hunt a pod of whales. Soaring above the forest, the sky whales are safe as long as they stay high. The winds are faster here, making escape easier. The scouts come from a colony of more than 300 stalkers. And they're hungry. The scouts drop down beneath the Pakoda canopy to avoid detection. They're waiting for one of the sky whales to drop its guard so they can single it out for attack. The stalkers have three eyes giving them 360 degree vision, perfect for tracking the sky whales while maneuvering through this complex world. The Cape Stalkers are faster, stronger, and more agile than anything on Earth. Scientists here have modeled their way of life on the social insects. One of the most successful social systems on Earth is one we find in bees and wasps, for example. You have a queen, but you also have workers and other members responsible for different tasks. Now, on Blue Moon, we could imagine something rather similar, but interestingly, much larger, because remember, the atmosphere is denser and there's more oxygen. Animals like stalkers would be, in a sense, like giant hornets. They would be divided into a series of scouts looking for new opportunities. But they're also workers and the queen staying in the nest. The workers are faster and stronger than the scouts. They're the soccer army, and they're waiting for the scouts' signal to attack. It's a very, very successful way to run a large colony, and also to be very effective in cooperation, and that includes, of course, hunting. On the Earth, that same social organization is found not only in the insects, but extraordinarily even in the mammals. Now, if this has happened independently on Earth actually a number of times, then there's every reason to think it should occur elsewhere. The scouts are still doggedly tracking the whales. But they've adopted a risky strategy. The pagoda understory is draped with a lethal veil of tentacles. It's the lair of ambush predators. The scouts must avoid touching anything down here. There will always be the hunter and the hunted. This battle for survival is a major force that has shaped the destiny of life on Earth. On the blue moon, scientists believe it will be no different. I think there's only one thing that we can say is gonna be true of life everywhere. And that one thing is Darwinian evolution. That is the insight that we have from Earth that I think is completely generalizable. Life everywhere will reproduce, mutate, followed by natural selection. That process, I think, is as universal as the laws of gravity and relativity. Life here is six billion years old. It's complex and well-established. But how could life ever get started on an alien world like the Blue Moon? The answer comes from one of the biggest space discoveries in recent years. It happens when stars die. The supernova explosion is so bright it outshines entire galaxies. In its wake, it leaves behind a nebula, a vast cloud of dust and gas tens of light years across. Inside, carbon and all the other elements for life are created. What's interesting about this dust is that it's rich in organic material. That's the stuff of life out there in space. 
the biological material in our bodies and in plants and animals are proteins, and those proteins are made out of blocks called amino acids. Well, we see those same types of molecules, amino acids, out there in space. So that the basic building blocks of life are common throughout the galaxy, then why shouldn't life also be common throughout the galaxy? The discovery that stardust is raining down on planets and seeding them with the ingredients for life is astounding. It could mean that stardust is seeding life right across the universe. And on some worlds, conditions will be right for life to take hold. In any environment that is broadly similar to the Earth, water, energy, carbon, life will start there as well. So that the story of life could be unfolding in many different locations, independently each time. And as each story of life is written, it'll be a little different than the others. We think of our own world as being the perfect planet for life. But is it? The blue moon would in many ways be more habitable, particularly for forests, than the Earth. Carbon dioxide levels 30 times higher than on Earth will fuel rampant plant growth. The combination of a dense atmosphere and high levels of the greenhouse gas CO2 will act like a blanket keeping the moon very warm. You might expect a planet like the blue moon to have smaller temperature contrasts between the equator and the pole. There will be no polar ice caps and vegetation will carpet its entire landmass. On the blue moon we have plants and we also have forests and amongst the most astonishing are the pagoda trees. Now these are immense, absolutely gigantic. They're more than a kilometer high. That's eight times the height of the tallest trees on Earth. The ceiling of this world is a sea of sky ponds. Each tree has modified its leaves to collect rainwater and the whole forest is interconnected like one vast superorganism. So here are forests which are alien indeed. The trees on Earth could never grow so large. And the reason for this is effectively that inside the plant there is a set of tubes. It's a sort of conduction system which is responsible for taking the water from the roots up into the sky. And effectively what we see is there's a limit to the size, the height, of the column of the water. Now on Blue Moon, it's rather different. The pagodas don't need to draw water up from the ground. They collect it in their sky ponds, and then gravity does the rest. But the weight of the water in the sky ponds could make the tree collapse. The scientists have overcome this by imagining the forest as interconnected. It will give the pagodas enormous strength and stability. In principle, trees and a forest, based on this design, could get higher and higher and higher. What could that height be? It could be 500 or even 1,000 meters. It could be easily 10 times higher than trees on Earth. All life on the Blue Moon revolves around this vast cathedral of pagoda trees. Their sky ponds are a haven for many other aliens. Strange creatures hover above them. Giant kites. They use their tentacles like fishing lines to catch halibugs living in the ponds. The blue moon's dense atmosphere is perfect for supporting large creatures. But how is it possible for the kite to hang motionless in the air? On the blue moon, we get more support by pushing on this heavy air than we would by pushing on the lighter air that we've got here on Earth. So this kite, which might need quite a strong wind to get it airborne on Earth, will be taken up into the air by considerably weaker wind on the blue moon. Biomechanists predict a creature with this design could grow up to five meters across and still stay airborne. It's relying on moving wind and an aerofoil effect to keep itself up in the air. So this is going to look in cross-section just like an airplane wing. 
And when there's enough wind around, air passes over top and bottom, creating a pressure difference which lifts the body up, but it's kept in place by a tether, very much like a kite string. And then behind it, we have these tentacles that dangle into the water, just like a jellyfish tentacle, waiting to grab any larvae that it hits. The kite's fishing grounds are vast. Beneath the pagoda's dense canopy, light from the twin suns rapidly dims. More than a kilometer below is a strange world. No natural light reaches here. In these abyssal depths, life depends on food falling down from above. Glowing scavengers hover in the air. Higher up in the twisted tangle of the canopy is another unique world. It's the lair of the death traps. The great halls of the forest are draped with their lethal tentacles. You never escape the embrace of the death trap. The stalker faces a slow death, dissolving in a bath of acid. But the need to provide for the colony drives the surviving scouts on. It won't be long before one of these gentle giants is singled out and the fury of the stalker army is unleashed. The blue moon is a land of turmoil and change. Forest fires on the earth can be deadly. On the blue moon, they can be far more ferocious. They can sweep through huge areas, fanned by winds, fueled by the oxygen. The destruction is massive, but the breaks left in the canopy will bring opportunity to others. A new alien is coming to life. The balloon plants. Blue Moon's dense atmosphere will enable plants to float in the sky. The field of balloons gently sway in the breeze, anchored to the canopy with long tethers. The biomechanists have calculated plants like this could grow to the size of a small hot air balloon. It's an extraordinary vision of what alien vegetation could be like. If you want to float in an atmosphere, you need a lighter-than-air gas, and the best gas on demand, simply by splitting water molecules, is hydrogen. At first sight, hydrogen might seem to be a very strange gas to use. No. On Earth, in fact, a number of organisms produce hydrogen. You might think, oh, that's very alien, nothing like that. Well, no, not really. If we go back to our own Earth, let's remind ourselves about the kelp forests. Because here, we see these great strands of seaweed, in a thick water, but supporting themselves with bladders full of gas. Is that so very different from the balloon plants of Blue Moon? I don't think so. Both are equally alien. When conditions are right, the balloons can rise high above the pagodas. It's a simple way to compete for light on a planet where plant life is rampant and space is at a premium. The balloon plants are opportunistic. What they do is when a part of the underlying forest has been removed by a fire, for example, they very rapidly colonize it. They release parts of the plant which drift away. Here, these giant balloons will join clouds of tiny plants that spend their lives drifting in the sky, the algae. 
So high up in the atmosphere, there'll be innumerable tiny algae. It's really like the plankton of the Earth's ocean. And this, I think, will give an almost greenish haze to many parts of the sky as these things drift around in colossal numbers. So this atmosphere, in a sense, is an enormous larder. It's full of food. And if there's food floating around, especially in the form of algae, then it would be natural to imagine that there will be animals grazing that resource. The floating plants concentrate in vast green clouds, and the sky whales scoop them up in colossal mouthfuls. The blue moon will take about 10 Earth days to orbit around its parent planet. There will be five days of light and five days of darkness. The temperature difference creates intense thermals which the sky whales ride with ease. To be an effective filter feeder, you need to be quite large because every time you open your mouth to start filtering, there's a huge drag. So what I see the sky whales doing is spiraling up these thermals and then come down with a large mass behind them because they're big, opening up their mouths and ramming a lot of aerial plankton through. If you're small, you do that, stop and fall out of the sky. Feeding well below the main pod, one sky whale has dropped in altitude. It's the moment the scouts have been waiting for. The lone sky whale continues to graze. It's in mortal danger. The scouts stealthily gain height. They must get above the whale. Gathering speed, they pass low over the whale. And in one swift flyby, it's sprayed with a powerful scent. The whale is marked like a beacon. The stalker army will now be able to find the whale wherever it goes. Panic spreads through the whale pod. The marked whale's only chance is to climb as high as it can on the thermals and try to escape gliding downwind. The scouts now race back to the colony to summon the workers. The idea that a trail of chemicals, pheromones, could be used by the stalkers on the blue moon may seem rather unlikely. Wouldn't the scent be dispersed in the atmosphere? Well, no, I don't think so, because in point of fact, remember, this atmosphere is much denser. Pheromones can be detected at tiny concentrations. It's an economic, cheap way of leaving the trail behind, the trail which takes the workers to their prey. The scouts return sends a wave of excitement through the colony. The sky whale will be lucky to survive. One of the arguments about looking for extraterrestrial life is will it also be intelligent? And many people feel no, intelligence is an evolutionary fluke. But everything else we know about evolution is not only does it find similar solutions, but it finds them again and again and again. Blue Moon stalkers are highly organized, a terrifying adversary. Like the social insects, theirs is a shared intelligence, very different to our own. Each worker has a small brain, and they don't solve the problem by stepping back from it and thinking about it. They actually solve the problem by having lots of individuals exploring for answers. Life on other planets might have evolved entirely down that route, and that, that could be the dominant form of life, and in a sense suppress the evolution of more individualistic forms of intelligence. An alien army is unleashed. Hundreds of workers home in on the sentry left by the scouts. 
They move as one. A formidable swarm. Speed is critical. They know the marked whale will be trying to gain height. The panicking whale is still dangerously low. The scent rail is getting stronger and stronger. Its desperate battle to escape has failed. The attack is savage. The workers tear into its fragile honeycomb's wings, puncturing its buoyancy cells. fill the air. Slowly, the giant begins to drop from the skies. The stalkers follow and wait. The defenseless whale is slowly ripped to pieces. Then its flesh is carried back to the roost to feed a new generation of hungry stalkers. The giant struggles become weaker and weaker. It's all part of the great cycle of life in the Blue Moon's Pagoda Forest. The stalker colony is a formidable force. Everything they do is governed by their collective intelligence. But how far might this intelligence evolve? Could they one day match or even exceed our own on Earth? It's really tempting to think whether this might go further. After all, they're active hunters, they're communicating, they're working effectively in packs. Is it possible to imagine that one day they would go so far as to develop a technology to hunt those sky whales? I don't see why not. One of the intriguing things, I think, that might be in the future of the stalker is that they might end up farming the whales rather than just crudely predating them. In fact, you could imagine them dominating the, the, the entire surface of the planet and the surface of its atmosphere in this way. Lightning ignites the forest. The fire is immense consuming everything in its path. The balloon plants filled with hydrogen explode like bombs, casting their seeds over the surface of the planet. And from this destruction, a new life will emerge. Life will continue to evolve on the Blue Moon, as it has done for millions of years. I think that one day we may indeed find something rather like the Blue Moon. I think this is no longer the stuff of science fiction. I, I hope that I'm around when something like this is discovered. When the new telescopes are launched over the next 10 years, they will be pointing towards twin stars, searching for worlds like the Blue Moon. The landmark research done by the scientists here will help govern where we look for extraterrestrial life. Will we find planets like Blue Moon orbiting other stars, orbiting giant planets around other stars? The answer is almost certainly yes. There are so many stars with so many potential planets that we have to imagine there must be planets like these there. It's just a question of discovering them that far away.
Life on many worlds may not progress beyond simple bacteria. Others could evolve complex life. And some could evolve intelligence beyond our wildest expectations. Intelligence will almost certainly lead on many planets to a species which will want to visit the stars. And if indeed we do contact extraterrestrial life, our whole world picture will change forever. It could happen in our lifetime. <laughs>